Hi everyone, happy True Crime Sunday. We are back with another 10 minute true crime breakdown and this week I'm taking a dip into the serial killer pond. So, some murky water. If you're new here, hello. Each week I stick 10 minutes on the clock and tell you as much about a case as possible. I call it Bite Size True Crime and welcome to the party. We are currently on the road to 5k subscribers, so make sure you're hitting that button, you're commenting, you're sharing if you like my content. Let's get down to the reason that you're here. This week marks the anniversary of the inception of a serial killer, one of the worst actually that I've ever researched. You may recognize him from a Netflix show that he so kindly starred in. This week we're focusing on Arthur Shawcross. Now sources on this do differ, but according to the Crime and Investigation Network crime calendar, it was this week specifically on April the 7th, 1972, that Arthur Shawcross killed his first victim. And that's why I'm telling you about him today. Some places, some sources on the internet actually put the kidnapping and murder of 10 year old Jack Blake in May of the same year but for the sake of the anniversary we're going with April. I wanted to flag it with you in case you're familiar with him and you thought maybe I'd got it wrong, that's my source. Enough of the semantics though, let's get down to it and welcome to the anniversary. Arthur Sean Cross was born in June of 1945 in Maine in the USA. It would seem from the jump that he was born to be a serial killer, that like he had all of the traits growing up as a kid. He was a bedwetter, he was an arsonist, he set fire to stuff and he suffered multiple head injuries during his childhood as well interviews with his family they've said that he was super aggressive and he kind of ended up being a bully he says that he was sexually abused by his mum and then later his aunt as well he said that he had a sexual relationship with his sister and although his family deny all of this uh, and say that he had a wild imagination which is an understatement or if that's if it's not true some experts say that there is no way that Arthur Shawcross wasn't sexually abused and some say that he made it all up he did have a super low IQ he dropped out of school when he was 19 and he enlisted in the army and he was drafted to Vietnam when he was there he was on like missions and that and he said that he raped and killed two Vietnamese girls and he ate them. Sorry, I forgot that he, he, it says it here. There's no evidence to prove this. He said that he has a combat kill tally of 29, which also there's no evidence to prove that. Uh, official documents put his total number of kills at a big fat zero, but okay. Back in the civilian world though, back in America, he was married four times throughout his life. He had a few kids during these marriages, but they all ended in divorce. And it was during his third marriage in 1972 this week that he committed his first murder confirmed murder if we're not believing the eating of the girls jack blake was um only 10 years old and he was a neighbor of arthur shawcross and his family he was suffocated by him in a wooded area somehow arthur had managed to lure the little boy away he sexually assaulted him as well and even though jack was reported missing and people in the area and police did go looking for him they didn't know that he was dead it took five months to to finally find him and once he was found pathologists saw that his genitals had actually been bitten off during his murder. Um, when the police were doing their rounds and gathering info, Arthur's name actually came up a few times by multiple people because he was seen a few days before Jack went missing with him. He took him fishing. He denied, 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 of course, said he had nothing to do with it and there wasn't really any evidence and the police didn't find any reason to question him more. In September of that same year, the body of an eight-year-old Karen Hill was found under a bridge. She had also been raped and murdered. Arthur's name came up again because neighbours remembered seeing him around the bridge with Karen and he actually confessed but he confessed to both murders so Jack and Karen but his lawyers managed to get him a plea deal so because there wasn't a lot of evidence physical in the case of Jack he wasn't charged with that murder and they pled down to manslaughter when it came to eight-year-old Karen and he pled guilty he got a reduced charge the public was furious but he got 25 years in prison and that should really be the end of this episode I mean he was caught two murders bang to rights 25 years in jail but it's not been 10 minutes yet what do you mean no 
course not, because 15 years after he was convicted of the manslaughter of um, little Karen, he was released from prison because of good behaviour. When he got out, he actually found it super hard to settle back in New York because even though a decade and a half had passed, the people them of the neighbourhood remembered who he was and they knew exactly what he had done and they weren't having it. He went to the police, to the parole people, and he was like, oh, I'm having a really tough time because they know that I'm a killer, help me. So what they did is that they smuggled him into a new community in Rochester in New York and then they sealed his criminal record. It was sealed from public and police view. So the local police wouldn't have been able to see what he got up to in the past. And as you can imagine, that causes a lot of problems because over the next year, Arthur Shawcross killed 12 women. In March of 1988, the body of a 27-year-old woman was found in the Genesee River. They found her body under the ice and they saw that she had bite marks across her lower half, like where her genitals were, and that she had been strangled. The police also determined that the killer was sneaking back to the body and cutting bits of it, like eating bits off of the decomposing body. Mm. In September of 1989, another sex worker was found with bite marks and strangulation. In October of 1989, a 59 year old homeless woman was found. Six days later, a sex worker was found. Both of these women were strangled and the press finally got hold of the story. And that's when the moniker, the Genesee River Killer was given. Cause you know the press, they can't talk about uh, killings without giving somebody a nickname. They also called him the River Monster as well, but not to be mistaken for the Green River Killer. That's a different guy. So when investigating, the authorities deduced that the killer would have to have had some criminal past. They quite rightly thought that whoever was killing these women, it wasn't their first rodeo. And they went in their database and they searched all of the murderers and all of the criminals that were living in the area. But Arthur's records were sealed, so his name didn't come up. Over time, more and more sex workers were continuing to disappear. It became quick, pretty apparent that it was a regular customer and someone who was comfortable with the sex workers. They asked them if there was anyone who was particularly aggressive or that they were scared of, and multiple people uh, named a guy called Mitch or Mike. And they said he was an angry client, he was super intimidating, and he was prone to violence. And then the body of a 26 year old woman was found on Thanksgiving, and she had been strangled and part of her genitals had been removed. Also, she was cut from her throat all the way down to her crotch, like how you would cut an animal if you were draining their blood. And this is when the local police got the FBI involved. They did a profile of the killer, and they said it was someone in their mid to late 30s, somebody who had killed before, who was very comfortable with the area and with his victims. And they found that the last victim was proof that not only was the killer escalating, but he was getting more and more comfortable around dead bodies, and somebody who was getting sexual pleasure from revisiting where he was dumping the bodies as well. In December of 1989, there was a pair of jeans found near the Genesee River, and in the pocket was some ID. And the police believed that it was possibly a victim of the Genesee River killer. They did an aerial search a few weeks later in January of 1990, and they spotted something that looked like the naked body of a woman. She wasn't the woman that was on the ID, she was another missing sex worker. Whilst the helicopter was still in the air, rotaries on, just chopping all around the place, they spotted a man on a bridge next to a car or like a van and he looked like he was doing something. He had that his, his willy was out and he was either having a wee or he was doing something. And it was Arthur returning to the scene, masturbating. The police go over there, they ask him what's he doing on the bridge, they want his ID, he doesn't have it, he hasn't got a license to be driving the van that he's in, it's his girlfriend's because serial killers, yeah, they stay bayed up, like they stay married, they stay engaged, they stay having girlfriends and boyfriends and a regular, regular smart folk who want girlfriends and boyfriends can't be finding husbands and wives but serial killers somehow always have wives. I'm digressing and he tells them that he was in jail for manslaughter, hence not having a license. So obviously they just start like, taking him in for questioning and that. But he doesn't confess to any of the murders that have happened in the New York area in the past year. They take a picture of him there and then at the station and bring it to the sex workers that they had spoke to and lo and behold, it is Mitch. 
So what they do is they bring his girlfriend, Clara, in for questioning. And then when she comes in, they notice that she is wearing some lovely jewellery that she says is a gift from Arthur, but ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, round up, round up and roll in, you've guessed it, it was a bloody token taken from a victim. A bit like the falling, fallen on Netflix, you know, with, with Gillian Anderson, a little bit like that. And then he confessed and he even went as far as to show them the locations of some bodies that hadn't even been discovered yet. While he was confessing, he gave some of the most bizarre reasons for killing that I've ever heard. A lot of the time he said that it was self-defense, like someone bit him, so he killed them. Someone was trying to rob him, so he killed them. Uh, someone was making too much noise during sex, so he killed them. He confessed to eating parts of the bodies as well. Oh. The defense uh, pled insanity, PTSD, a cyst on the brain, a rare genetic defect, his mum's voice. They blamed the kitchen sink on Arthur Shaw Cross's crimes, but he was found guilty anyway, and he was sentenced to 250 years in prison. When I was younger, I used to think that when people were sentenced to 250 years or like 500 years in prison, you'd like serve your sentence if you survived for 50 of those years, and then they'd keep your body for the rest of the time. I don't think that's how it works, but that's just how my English brain thinks it works because we don't really sentence people like this in England. But in 2008, in November, uh, he was taken to hospital when he complained of some pain and he died of a cardiac arrest and our time is up. That is the story of Arthur Shawcross, AKA the Genesee River Killer, AKA the River Monster, and AKA a bunch of other monikers that I just didn't take the time to remember. I will definitely link that Netflix documentary in the description. I believe it's called Interview with a Serial Killer or Conversation with a Serial Killer, and it's him with an interviewer before he died in jail, and he is sassy with it. Now, there's one point where he doesn't want to talk about something, and he's like, I ain't chatting about that like it or lump it and it's like rah bruv relax relax i'll also put some more information on his victims in the description like who they were their names everything that i couldn't include in the video and a bit more about them some pictures as well so make sure you take advantage of that and road to 5k so make sure you're subscribing telling your mates if you like this content and for more daily should i say true crime updates follow my dedicated Instagram page. Laundry list of things to do, but thank you for watching. Thank you for rocking with me. And I'll be back next week with some more 10 minute true crime. Uh, yeah, thanks. I should have warned you about the, uh, about the eating people bit though, shouldn't I? <laughs>